in every country that was involved in the war, there were growing problems at home. After so many years of struggle, the disillusionment of the battlefront now extended to the home front. Russia, in particular, was ripe for revolution. Its people were starving, and its battered army was on the verge of defeat. In February 1917, a food riot broke out in the city of Petrograd, which had been called St. Petersburg. In no time, Russia was embroiled in full-scale revolution. The ruling family, led by Tsar Nicholas, was brought down. 300 years of royal rule were replaced by a provisional government that stubbornly decided to continue the war. The Germans chose this moment to help a Russian revolutionary return home from exile, a man who spoke for a socialist movement known to Russians as the Bolsheviks. His given name was Vladimir Ulyanov. He's better remembered as Vladimir Lenin. Sasha Bryansky served as Lenin's bodyguard. He spoke with a lot of gestures thrust forward, calling us to advance, saying power had been taken over by the bourgeoisie that went on with the bloody war. A new order had to be established to ensure the power of the working class. Lenin and the Bolsheviks hoped to create the world's first communist state, where all land, capital and political power would be given to the people. For many Russians, it would mean the end of privilege. Victory of the Bolsheviki would mean the end of Russia. That we, that we knew. I remember one evening at our country place, I was running down the lawn to call my mother to tell her that supper was ready. And I suddenly stopped. And there was all the beauty around, the roses, the trees, the park, the lawns. It was a beautiful place. It was sunset. And I stopped and said, all this disappears. All this will be gone. That was the one moment I remember, that feeling of fear that the whole world of which I was part was disappeared. And it would. In October 1917, Lenin encouraged an insurrection against the provisional government that had replaced the fallen Tsar. The end came at the Tsar's old winter palace. I ran up the carpeted stairway. In the very first room, I saw soldiers standing with their rifles ready. I shouted, down, put down your weapons. The defenders just dropped their weapons and left. We saw the fires in the night. And then, after five or six days, the shooting died. There were no more guns. So we knew it was over. And we knew that the Bolsheviki had won. With Lenin's victory, Russia quickly withdrew from the war. But the Germans had seen their plan succeed only to find that they now faced a new opponent. It was clear to most Americans now that Germany regarded them as an enemy too. President Woodrow Wilson resisted the demands to get involved for a while. But by 1917, the Germans had increased their attacks on unarmed ships. And then they brazenly urged Mexico to invade the United States. The president felt he had no other option. On April the 2nd, 1917, Woodrow Wilson stood anxiously before a special session of Congress and asked for a declaration of war. He hoped it would be the war to end all wars. He said, it is a fearful thing for me to try to lead a great peaceful people into war. 
It could be one of the most terrible and disasters of all wars. But let me tell you this. Right is more precious than peace. The idea of a last great war and being part of it was very, very strong, strong appeal. And it certainly influenced me a great deal. I said, if we're never going to see another war, this is the time to see it. In the summer of 1917, American troops landed in France, returning the favor of Lafayette, the French soldier who had fought with America during the Revolutionary War. One of the officers, he said it loud enough for everybody to hear. Lafayette, he was waving his hand. Lafayette, Lafayette. I didn't know who Lafayette was. Lafayette, Lafayette, we are here. <laughs> We was coming to the end of our men, and when the Americans decided to have a go, uh, I, I was absolutely, I could have said all right. They were untouched by the anxiety and um, doubt that had afflicted everybody else by that stage. They were, they were American, you know, they were Ameri they were what Americans were supposed to be. They were enthusiastic. They were also badly armed, poorly trained, and like the Europeans before them, completely unprepared for what lay ahead of them. The train came through from the front. And we got to go aboard, of course, which we did as soon as we could get on it and ask the guys how it was up there, what's going on, and what do you do, and, and it was a hospital train. I can see these poor kids, like me, youngsters, with a leg gone, or two arms gone, Well, this was a, a kind of a cold water treatment all of a sudden to, to realize what war was like. You grew up very quickly in uh, surroundings like that. It was no longer freshman studies. It was uh, the real world. By 1918, with thousands of Americans pouring into France every day, the Germans decided they had to do something massive. In March 1918, the German army tried its last major gamble, last major offensive on the Western Front, and it was successful. It was a remarkable moment. The Western Front moved. The War of Movement finally arrived. And after years of impasse, the Germans suddenly threatened to overwhelm the Allies and actually capture the French capital, Paris. The Germans had a fire. They called it sweeping fire. Everything up on earth got hit. Uh, they either was wounded or died. The threat to Paris was so severe that a million people simply left the city. The Germans got to within 30 miles. At this point, these still semi-trained American divisions were thrown into the bath, and along with the French, managed to stop the German drive. The Germans had put everything into this last desperate effort, and when it was over, they were finally spent. Along the Western Front that autumn, 
the focus shifted from war to peace. On the 10th of November, the Kaiser was forced into exile by his own government, a victim of the war he had helped to start. This struck me so deeply that I can tell you I had a little picture of the Kaiser in my room. What did I do? I put a black tie around the picture to show my utter sorrow for this tremendous change in, in, in history. And finally, at the 11th hour, on the 11th day of the 11th month, November 1918, the Germans formally surrendered. And suddenly, the guns stopped, and it was a terrible shock. It was as if somebody had hit me over the head with a big pan. That sudden hush, after four years of continual gunfire, had become part of our life, there seemed to be something missing. We didn't believe it, you know. One of the greatest calamities in human history was over, and America's veterans began to return home. The trouble was that having made the world a safer place, American veterans returned to a very uncertain future. The economy that had boomed during the war was now shrinking. Factories were laying off workers, just as veterans came looking for jobs. We had no help to find a job, no grants to go to school and finish our college education. When you took your discharge, that was it. You had no more connection with the government or they with you. You were on your own. 